Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Welcome to the show. This week, as crises reveal the weaknesses in our systems, opportunities to make change arise. That's true in business, in relationship, and it's no less true in our example of the years since the financial crisis of 2008. Since then, in fact, you'd be surprised by how much has changed, said our next guest. He said in a recent speech that we need to catch up with ourselves. A movement for a new economy has advanced by leaps and bounds. This is the kind of analysis I like, so I'm happy to bring Gar Alperovitz back to talk about it. He's professor of political economy at the University of Maryland and co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative. He's also the author of many books, the most recent of which is What Then Must We Do? Straight talk about the next American Revolution. So there you were, the Common Bound Conference of the New Economy Coalition in Boston, and you said we needed to catch up. So catch us up. This conference you're talking about, there were six or seven hundred people. The last time they did it two years ago, I think they were pushing to get three or four hundred. Yeah. So the notion that we, uh, and it's a preliminary notion, that we need a different economic system is beginning to generate response and interest in, in broader circles than the traditional left, so that it's penetrating different parts of the country. Now that doesn't mean we're achieving the end goal, but there are many, many more people interested in not only worker cooperatives, which is a small piece of the puzzle for smaller firms, but for more complex developments. As you know, in Cleveland, there's a complex community-wide complex of worker co-ops with a planning system and more interesting integrated systems. Uh, other parts of the country, Boulder's just municipalized a, a big utility. They're using eminent domain in Richmond, California. There's 20 states that are considering public banks legislation. There's another 20 that are having public uh, health systems and the single payer are on, on the line. Uh, land trusts have expanded, which is neighborhood ownership of land or city ownership. Uh, at least over, if you look at the last four to five years, you're seeing more of that. Um, what interests me about that is these all demonstrate in one preliminary way some form of democratizing the ownership of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, they're beginning points, not end points. And, you know, this is an American country is, is, is a nation which has no traditional socialist uh, idea of changing the ownership of capital. So in a sense, it's penetrating, I think, a different idea in a very down-home American way that we can begin to say, Capital can be changed. Mm. Ownership and power can be changed. Now, you talk about preliminary, and for sure it, we're in preliminary stages, but we're not as preliminary as we were last time we talked. <laughs> That's um, right. For example, the question of poverty reduction. Uh, this has been a question that's been raised by many people as an urgent need in our society. Worker-owned co-ops have been seen as a potential way to reduce poverty. Are we seeing any results yet from any of these initiatives at, on the level of metrics like that? Well, the poverty numbers are still going down, getting worse, not getting better. And the larger system is decaying, both inequality, poverty, those are all getting worse. Climate change, slight changes because of the fraction of what's happening with fracking, but basically the 30-year trend is down. Almost every major indicator is a long 30-year trend. Uh, poverty is no exception. The attempt in some cities in very poor neighborhoods, you know about the Cleveland model, which is you know 40 percent unemployment in the neighborhood, uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, there is an attempt, because the traditional programs, liberal programs, taxing, spending, the tiny bits or job programs simply fail, there's an attempt to set up some form of ownership. What's interesting about the Cleveland model and others that begin to look at comprehensive strategies, the attempt is to work with the community level and to integrate them with some larger structure, in this case getting hospitals and universities, which are largely funded by the public, to begin buying from a collective organization in the poverty neighborhoods. So you're not just dealing with organizing a workplace differently, you're actually talking about dealing with organizing a whole community in a new way. That's, you know, that's the essence of the argument, and I think that takes us beyond either worker self-management or worker ownership, and certainly beyond private ownership. Uh, so the models that are getting more sophisticated in a, in a preliminary developmental phase both introduce a new concept, who owns capital is important, and they're beginning to move to the community level. Um, I worked several, as you know, several years ago with the steel workers in Youngstown, Ohio. That was also the concept, not worker ownership alone, but a community-wide slash worker ownership of a steel mill in that case, 
promulgated in, in part by the steel workers, in part by some of us who are working with them. It was a much broader idea than, than that. And I think we're advancing in that direction. Well, that's an interesting story to tell to, for people that haven't heard it. We first pick up the story in the 1970s yes. when the steel workers union, the, the, national, the international union, was against it. What happened? Now, that's what's interesting. If you look at this over a 30-year trend, the workers at the local level came up with the idea of big mill went down, Youngstown sheet and tube, 5,000 people lost their job. The local workers came up with the idea, why don't we take over the whole mill with the community? It was a very interesting vision. Uh, the international leadership saw these young rebel workers becoming activists, challenging the international as well as the conception of who gets to own capital, and they tried to put it down. And I think they were probably instrumental, along with the corporations, in getting the Carter administration to crush it. Initially, they had built enough political pressure to get support even from the national offices. That was reversed. If you look over time, the Steelworkers International now is supporting worker ownership and various forms of worker ownership, like these more complex community-wide models. They're open to change. And I think that's, I look at the progressions that way, both in terms of ideas, uh, ideology, cracking the ideology that capital matters is a really important thing. But I'm hearing you emphasize the question of scale and connections. Um, last time when we spoke, or, or a few years ago when we spoke, you were more emphasizing throw any number of experiments at the wall and see what sticks. Now I'm hearing something slightly different. That When you spoke at Common Bound the other day, you talked about, well, you were critical of what you called projectism. What is yeah, that? The, you know, I'm, I think projects are important and projectism is a dead end. My project's better than your project. You don't advance in terms of conceptual development without actually beginning to open up some of these new spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, if there were a revolution tomorrow, people wouldn't know what to do with it. The content would not be developed in both in the idea sphere, which is very weak, and in on the ground. So I'm very interested both in developing models that begin to suggest directions and, more important, beginning to open up the idea that you can do this. Cracking the ideology, it's a Gramscian idea. How do you do that in America where there's very little history of these ideas at all being p present? Uh, so I, I do think the projects are important, they're experimental, but if you stay at that level, we, we go nowhere except mm -hmm. projects. So what is the U.S. history on this front? Well, you, you know, we had 19, pre-World War II, we had a serious socialist party, and it had a municipal community content to it as well as a national content and some worker ownership. It was a very mixed, complex idea. Uh, it was killed in World War I, and, and uh, Eugene Debs was put in prison, and then the Red Scare. So it's been a long period of anti-communism that has not permitted a serious, genuine discussion and you know, experimentation with a whole new vision of where to go. I think that's opening up. Mm. I mean, I think we're just, just beginning to open up in, in ways that capture American cultural themes but also begin looking at uh, who gets to own the capital. So to people who are watching this maybe from elsewhere, what characterizes the United States economy these days? Is it the wealth and, and the affluence at one end and the waste that you've mentioned? Or is it the poverty that we read about, most often described as existing in, I don't know, pockets? You know, I, I think both those, the extreme change in, in who gets to own wealth is, it's so extremely concentrated, 400 people. I mean, this is a number that's staggering. 400 people have more wealth than the bottom 180 million taken together. That was an extraordinary kind of concentration of wealth in the companies they own. Um, but I think, and the poverty levels, as, as we know, you know if, you, if we measure them by the standards used by the rest of the world, which half the me half the median, We'd have 70 million people in poverty. We use a phony standard that was set up by bureaucrats, so it doesn't come quite to that level. Um, but what characterizes, I think, what's interesting about the United States today is we're neither in crisis of a classical kind, nor does the system reform in a social democratic liberal pattern. It is what I would call punctuated stagnation, that it, it doesn't collapse, but it doesn't succeed over long periods, and then there are inflation or crises, minor crises. Um, you know, there, those, there were, Sweezy had that idea long ago and all of a sudden it's Paul Krugman's come around to it in a different form. Or Paul Sweezy the economist. Paul Sweezy the Marxist economist, now the, Keynes, the Keynesians also in this. But the notion that we might be in an intermediate form for an extended period, uh, I think that's a po possibility It may go on for mm. some time. But that is an interesting period for developing new ideas and new organizing. If there were a crisis tomorrow, the left would certainly not know what to do with it, and the right would probably take over. But in the period we're in, I think we're getting a reassessment 
uh, and hopefully a more sophisticated reassessment as time goes on, as people begin theorizing about it, and developing theory and projects, mm -hmm. and more complex projects. Uh, that's all prehistory from my point of view, laying groundwork both in the practical sphere but also in the ideological sphere that might take us somewhere. So what do you think happens next? Um, I know you're working on a project, the next <laughs> systems project. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's time, and I think we can do this. I think you can open the subject that we face a systemic crisis, not a political problem, and there's a great distinction, that you have to change the system, and that more and more Americans beyond the left, beyond people we talk to, understand that and you can speak to it. Even putting the subject on the table and engaging different constituencies in that question I think is, I think is possible for the first time, certainly in my lifetime, in a, in a larger sense. One thing people may have heard about when they talk about alternatives is what has happened at Mondragon in the Basque yep. region of Spain, where the Fagor factory, one of the institutions that is part of the Mondragon network of worker-owned cooperatives, um, well, declared bankruptcy, didn't it, yeah, earlier this it year? What's the reality of what happened there? Well, Mondragon's a very special kind of organization, you know, com very complex in the history of the Basque country and the suppression of Franco's and, the, and Catholic social thought. They built this 80,000 person complex uh, cooperative model. Uh, it was not a systemic model. It never attempted that. It was always up against the world market. It was up against the Chinese and the East Europeans and it was up against the Spanish economy. So it did not have any attempt or wish to be a system changing model. It was very interesting in the cooperative relationships that they developed. I wrote a piece on this recently saying, you know, if you really were talking about using Mondragon or larger, for larger systems, you have to embed it in a system planning structure and a, a view of a, a whole design rather than in the marketplace. Uh, and I think that's what they ran into. And what happened to the people when it, the factory went down? Well, that is interesting because they have a culture of trying to hire and support and bring them in in other ways. And I think there are 50 or 60 percent of them have all have come back in and they're planning to bring the rest back in as well. So there is a, some collective vision of trying to solve that problem. But they were up against the, you know, the global market and the Spanish market, and that's not something you can do at the level of one institution. There is a question of politics in all this. Does the economic movement that you see have its companion in the political piece? I think the new economy movement that we're seeing is not yet political. And if it stays without a politics, without a much more confrontational politics, it'll stay in the corner. So. Um, Yes, you've got to raise it, raise it to a different level. The con it's beginning to develop ideas and fragments of content and beginning to show the practicality of much larger systems and theories in, in the larger culture, not restricted to the people I talk to <laughs> regularly or to the left. So that's a very important contribution, but it has not yet reached in, and begun to develop a politics around that. So at, at some early point, that has to happen. The other thing about some of the smaller projects, though, and I think, it, and I think we have to... Uh, thanks some of the anarchists for this, that they are, some of them, very concerned about changing the cultural relationships mm -hmm. and the human relationships and trying to make sure that as we go forward, we're not rebuilding the same culture with, both within firms and within communities. You stroke, spoke very strongly at Common Bound to the individual yep. needing to take a serious look at their own role in this. Um, People matter. Leadership matters. Whether you're talking about ESOPs or credit unions or co-ops or any of this work, uh, it can go one way or another depending on the motivations of the people involved. Yep. What is your message to each <laughs> one of us and, and where do you draw your inspiration? What I often say is we face a system problem, but when it comes down to it, it is an existential problem. That is, the question is, what is it when you look in the mirror in the morning that you're willing to do that takes a risk and moves you beyond what you've been doing yesterday? So it really comes right back to your own question of motivation and, and willingness to get, get off your duff and begin doing something uh, to get at it, to get at it. So, uh, you know, the other thing I, I think, anybody serious about a system problem, you don't play this game unless you're talking about decades. At least maybe there will be an earlier break. But if you if you're care about altering something as extraordinary as a political economic system, um, we're talking about laying down serious commitments and the, the chips of this game are decades of your life. And I think people need to grapple with what it is they really want to do. Having said that, I don't knock projects. I think projects are a starting place. And I like to see the projects build, but if we stay there, we're, we're never going to get on. Yeah. 
you finally talked about reclaiming our humanity is yeah. part of this yep. uh, work. In the next system, will humans, will we do humanness differently? <laughs> <laughs> we certainly could. I mean, not, I mean, there is an existential cultural possibility at any level of any system at any time, at even extreme poverty. In fact, you see sometimes more humane yeah. kind of cooperation there. But, you know, I sometimes like to remind people we don't have an economic problem. Yeah. This economy is producing $200,000 a year for every family of four right now, even in the midst of recession, stagnation, decay. You could you know, divide that up to the family, and you could cut it to the 40-hour week and have a 20-hour week, and still $100,000. That's not an economic problem, it's a political and power problem. And there's plenty of space for a more relaxed and human kind of culture uh, in this system, if we, if we were serious about it. Um, but that requires actually beginning to think systemically, both about structures of power and dynamics, but also what it is that we're trying to do. What is the humanism? What is the quality of it? What is the culture? What are the relationships? Uh, some of the smaller projects, I think, are also important in that respect because they, they embody a different way of relating to each other and keep reminding the kind of uh, more austere revolutionaries among us that there's another dimension and that can't be lost if we're serious about the systemic change. Garal Parvitz, always great to talk with you. Great to be here. Thank you. What really sparked me, it, was, it said, worker owned by women. So, <laughs> so I was like, that sounds like something I want to get involved with. Well, it's caring work, it's poor women doing the work, it's um, disproportionately minority women doing the work. They're excluded from wage protections. We just came to the position that the only form of, of business that where workers would get decent wages and be protected would be in a worker-owned business. We had to be successful as a business. That our ideology and our values about um, worker empowerment, and we had to balance that with the fact that we were nothing if we couldn't create the job, a successful business. We only hire people who we train. We will not train people unless we can place them on a job. Uh, we train people for five weeks and we teach them all that they need to know about doing their job, but we also give them the opportunity to interact a lot with their fellow students. Um, and we teach both the hard skills uh, in terms of how to care for individuals in their home, and we also teach a lot of soft skills, okay, which is about relationship management, you know, and relationship building. And the, one of the great problems in home care is that there is no shop floor. The shop floor is essentially everybody, every patient's home, and you don't really know what goes on in the home. You have to trust the workers, and you have to hire workers as if they're taking care of your own mother or, or father. A stable workforce in this environment is a very, very difficult thing to achieve, okay? You want people to stay, okay? We do job satisfaction surveys all the time. And people, one of the most important things that our workers talk about and why they stay here is that they feel that they have respect. We're looking for new leadership. We're looking for home care workers like ourselves. To volunteer to help run the company and make decisions for us as home care workers. Okay. You can nominate yourself. You look like somebody who's outgoing who can speak their mind. I am. Yeah, you go. Put your name there and sign. I was like, okay, let me see if they're true to their word. You know, so I decided that I was going to actually be a part of the board. Thank you very much. And I, to my amazement, it was really about what what my opinion was of things how you think the workers are going to feel about certain issues and um i was i was pleased whether you're an owner or not at chca you have the right to participate 
So you have the right to weigh in. So you really do have to do the work of helping them um, develop the skills and the knowledge to be able to feel like they are, are they are contributing in a meaningful way. They start out participating in certain work groups and as they learn more about the company and the finances and what and the decisions that have to be made on a day-to-day -day operational basis then when they feel they're comfortable with that then they'll run for board positions. By the time they get to the board of directors they're familiar with the operations of the company and the kinds of decisions that the board has to make. When a company agency makes a profit as a worker owner we get a dividend. Sometimes we do well and we get a dividend and a bonus. There's sometimes when the company doesn't make a profit so on being a board member it's tough too because we have to make a decision whether we're going to have a dividend, um, how the dividend is going to be dispersed, I mean, how the profits are going to be dispersed, if we're going to keep some for hard times, if we're going to uh, contribute to the 401k. I would love to see the workers have a higher wage. They work extremely hard. I know how difficult that their heart is. And, I, and I'm hoping that people can appreciate what they do and see the value in their work and say, okay, I'm gonna support you, you know, in, in your career, because it's really, it's a career. A wave of protests engulfs the city, demanding attention to a lack of democracy. Police fire tear gas, local lawyers object, and instead of dispersing, the protests grow. A week in, thousands of students are boycotting their classes and major junctions of the city are occupied and shut down. Peaceful protesters in black are receiving respectful attention from the public and the press. And the story is worldwide front page news. Well, that story is actually from Hong Kong, but what if it wasn't? What if that was the story of the same week in New York? What if after 400,000 people marched through Manhattan demanding climate justice, those protesters hadn't dispersed? What if instead of hopping on buses and piling onto highways, those protesters had refused to go home? In Hong Kong, the people in the streets have a few clear demands. They're seeking elections with independent candidates. What if we'd rallied for the same? The Hong Kong Chinese want candidates, not cronies, not people picked in private by unaccountable, far-off committees. They want universal suffrage and a real say in the decisions that matter. What if the climate marches here had demanded the same? Universal suffrage and publicly funded elections, no payments to political campaign committees, not by rich people or corporate people, none. If direct democracy is a good enough demand for Hong Kong, surely we could try it here. The Hong Kong Democrats want Hong Kong policy set by people whose allegiance is local, not to far-off bureaucrats or the permanent power of permanent power. New York's participatory budgeting system's popular. How about demanding it be expanded? If in the majority of polls people want more spending on shared goods, including schools and transit and public energy, why should corporate donors be able to stop worthy projects in their tracks and push through dirty oil and gas pipelines instead? Speaking of gas, surely transparency over what's pouring into our shared soil and water is a reasonable demand. End patent protection on the composition of hydrofracking gases. Bring back public power. It all has the ring of an achievable goal. Decentralized power, public energy, local decision making. Are those Hong Kong's demands or ours? You tell me. One sure way to distinguish? Their protests seven days afterwards are still in the streets, while ours have gone home and business is back to usual. Tell me what you think by writing to me, Laura, at grittv.org. Thanks.